this computer. Okay. Okay, thank you, Charles. And, um, you know, it's nice to be at this uh, meeting. I think this is the, the third one, I guess. Uh, first, the first one was great because it wasn't virtual and I got to meet a lot of people, uh, some of, of whom are on this uh, conference call. So Charles, I actually, it was not, this is not my title, but um, <laughs> Charles, Charles sort of gave me this title, which is kind of fun uh, in a way. Um, and it's called Emerging Emergency and it's about uh, climate change. And he said, well, can you give a talk that would uh, somehow do something about the climate? Well, I don't think I can quite achieve uh, that that would be fantastic if I could, but I'd like to be speculative today. So I'm a little bit outside of my normal science, but still in the area that I work in. Um, and I'll talk about <clears throat> my particular personal view of uh, climate change. And I and I want to introduce a couple of concepts. And since we have a, you know, such a distinguished audience, um, I'd like the people to um, comment, disagree, whatever they want, you know, on, on this talk. So it's not like a, my standard kind of science, science talk that I'm giving. Um, so you're very lucky in that respect. Okay. So this is a picture, I think it's Germany uh, last year where they had floods and it, it, it made this uh, terrible damage. And we're all, I guess, everybody in this audience is sort of all converts, right? Um, if somebody doesn't sort of believe in the anthropogenic sources of climate change and things like that, great. I want to hear you at the end. It would actually be good to have an audience where people actually are, um, you know, sort of arguing against the, <laughs> the inevitable or whatever. Um, so I'll talk about I'll talk about climate change, and one of the things probably why Charles has uh, asked me to talk about this is because of two reasons. One, I do work on um, self-organized um, critical systems, actually, as a as a, a type of a method for for um, um, potential computation. We've actually done computation using self-organized critical phenomena. But <clears throat> for the last 10 years, I've given talks on um, to, uh, it's, a, it's a course for students on um, environmental chemistry. And it's actually really about um, an environmental science. So when I started, there were about 10 in the class and it was one of the most hated, um, 10 years ago, one of the most hated classes. And partially that was because it just involved tons and tons of calculations of small things, of individual components, let's say. And this is the- uh, A thousand pardons. I don't think you're recording, Charles. Okay, well, I just- Recording Me, it shows it's recording. Okay, I'll just keep going then. Okay, so the, the textbook I used, and if you look at environmental chemistry textbooks, um, there's quite a number, but they're all terrible. And they all have, uh, this is the outline here, and it was also the outline roughly of my uh, class, but I started to change it when I realized that all of these things here are more or less... Um, interconnected. And if you try to do a calculation on, I don't know, the levels of water pollution, or you look at um, oxygen levels and water, all sorts of things that are relating to so many other factors. Um, and when you have so many factors connecting things in the environment, you have a very complex situation through which um, phenomena that's associated maybe with one of these is not necessarily the important thing, but the interrelationship of these phenomena. Um, so at the moment, people um, are going around talking about the two degrees. Maybe you've heard about it, but if, um, if we can't control um, the uh, anthropogenic uh, emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, things like that, 
over the next coming years, we will have um, a dramatic increase in the temperature. Now, one of the things about climate change is that, you know, people talk about this is essentially this two degrees are, is about the statistics of weather. Okay, it's not about the complexity of weather and what's going on. It's just that if we increase the carbon dioxide, we increase the um, the amount of greenhouse gases, if we increase that, the infrared radiation reflected from the planet Earth is absorbed again and causes a heating effect. But there are many other phenomena that are occurring that are equally uh, probably devastating in terms of catastrophes and disasters to humans as we uh, proceed along this um, path. And things don't particularly look good. So what's happened is a lot of people have uh, have uh, tried to do something about it. And probably if you can remember in 2006, Al Gore, um, he gave a, he made a kind of movie um, which was a warning about how um, climate would change and it was called The Inconvenient Truth. And to tell you the truth, I found it really boring. And one of the problems is that when scientists talk about climate, uh, most people, most of the general public just switch off. They're not, not really interested. It's, it's, um, it's, it's something that doesn't connect to them. And likewise, with politicians, it's not necessarily the case. Inconvenient truth did make some kind of bump. So I, I, I am not going to compete with Al Gore. Um, certainly not going to... Uh, um, compete with DiCaprio um, and he brought, came out with this movie in uh, 2016 which was called Before the Flood so something like 10 years later um, I thought it was an interesting movie um, it, wasn't, it wasn't changing the world um, and then uh, if you look at, listen to Elon Musk's uh, description of um, what's going to happen to the environment. It sounds like a typical Musk thing. Well, here we have a simple engineering problem. Uh, maybe we can solve it, maybe we can, but he certainly is willing to put some money into it um, to um, try to remove carbon from the environment, particularly in the form of CO2. However, I, I personally, and this is what I'm interested in people's opinions, I'm not too optimistic about the fact that we can remove it just on the basis of thermodynamic and, and arguments. The amount of energy required to remove it would probably generate more carbon dioxide than we, we have originally. Um, another hero of mine since I've been a, a schoolboy listening to watching the BBC, listening to the BBC radio was, of course, Sir David um, Attenborough, a marvelous human being. And he has, uh, he has made so many, you know, brave efforts to try to change things, both at the, you know, the government level and also uh, in relationship to the public. Um, but, you know, he typically, again, you're speaking to the converted or maybe you can convert a few people, but the vast majority of the population couldn't give a monkey's. Just like COVID, you know, we, we have to um, actually, and this is going to be part of the argument, you have to get into a situation where disaster is beyond extreme and then uh, people start to react. It starts to generate a social um, effect. I'm going to talk about an effect called Dragon Kings, both in the environment and in the social economic um, scene. Anyway, these people did marvelous jobs much better than I'm going to do to convince anyone. And they don't seem to be that successful. They're partially successful. Probably one of the ones that's um, eliciting the most attention at the moment, and it's interesting, is, um, is uh, Don't Look Up, which is, again, uh, DiCaprio is involved in it. And I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a really interesting movie and 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 it, and it's generated a lot of arguments against it and for it and the fact it's generated this uh, discussion 
It's also been very uh, highly ranked in terms of the, you know, the number of people are watching it. That is something worthwhile. But it's, uh, again, viewing a situation where you have a, an, an emergency, a, a catastrophe about to happen. And it's about the inaction of uh, government organizations and the public in general and the media things like Fox News and the likes to actually um, impress upon the public the, the severity of the problem. And we have a severe problem. And it's not the kind of problem that we can solve in a very simple, fast manner. It's going to take tens of years, at least, to solve this problem of the climate change. Um, but this uh, movie is certainly one of the most uh, significant, I would say. Um, so the Quebec, DiCaprio has also talked to the United Nations and other people um, to try to um, try to change things, particularly a reliance on oil um, and fossil fuels. And if you consider that the, the gross, uh, the gross dom domestic product is proportional to the amount of energy used, and if you look at the percentage of renewables that have been achieved. It's interesting and it's good, wind power, um, water power, uh, solar power and so on, it's, but it's nowhere near enough. And we, and governments realize that we have to use um, these um, fossil fuels if we are to maintain um, this relationship between energy and GTB, GDP in the future. Um, however, one should not forget, um, you know, initial efforts that were viewed, people that were viewed to be cronies, you know, um, they weren't um, given uh, uh, much standing at the time. And one of them is Carl Sagan. And this is back, I believe, in 19, well, 1985, he was um, arguing again, arguing about the greenhouse gas effect. And he used... Um, I think an example of the planet Venus. In fact, I do as well, because if you take, um, since we're all physicists here, if you take the sun to be a black bo body radiator, um, you take some astronomical dimensions, the diameter of the earth and so on, you can do a back of the envelope calculation to calculate mm -hmm. based on the Stefan Boltzmann relationship, the temperature of the earth. And if you do that, you find it's, um, it's much colder, something like, if I remember, 20 or 30 degrees colder than you would expect. And the additional warming effect, which is a positive effect to a certain degree, it's called the Goldilocks effect, is that um, we have a, a very nice um, temperature on the planet Earth due to uh, greenhouse gases. And the other effect that's very important to planet Earth is when you look at it from a certain angle, you just see it as blue. It's just water if you turn the globe around. And water has a very high specific heat, latent heat um, of vaporization as well. And so that massive amount of energy that can be stored in the oceans thermally is uh, an essential. Everybody okay there? Okay, so one of, there's all sorts of solutions around. One of the most uh, ridiculous ones is the um, AI, artificial intelligence, can be used to um, solve the climate problem. Like AI can be used to solve it, right? You name it, uh, AI will solve it. Um, so if you actually look at um, AI, it's just the energy hog. And this is some of the statistics here of, uh, if you look at the carbon footprint of um, AI deep learning here, okay? Um, and it can reach, they believe, say 10 or more percent of the global energy consumption in the future. Bitcoin mining is 91 terawatts, which is the electricity consumption, I believe, of uh, Norway. Okay, so um, I don't think AI is necessarily the way to go to solve the climate problem. People have looked into alternative ways, and one of the 
unfortunate methods that we may uh, rely on is geoengineering. And there are many different types of geoengineering to change the albedo effect to meant a reflected light by putting things in the ocean, by um, also depositing material in the upper, upper atmosphere. And Edward Teller, who we all know, for H-bomb and so on, um, they come up with ideas for, um, for, uh, for engine, uh, global engine, uh, geoengineering, which involved um, releasing gases like sulfuric acid that would increase the albedo. And indeed it works because if you look at major volcanoes, um, they, can, they can have been shown to drop global temperatures by one or two degrees over a period of a number of years when you have a when you have this eruption of material in the upper atmosphere but this is not some kind of path that anyone would want to uh, pursue unless we're at the edge of um, catastrophe which uh, we are rapidly approaching so this uh, comes to this um, thing to do with distributions um, you all know the normal distribution, maybe the average height a person here is, I don't know, six foot, maybe. Maybe there's somebody at six foot, maybe there's somebody at four foot, it follows the Gaussian normal distribution typically. Um, you don't usually get people that are 20 feet in high. high. Um, but there are certain situations, particularly when things are interconnected, and most things in the world are interconnected and over many scales is that one tends to see something that's called a power law distribution. Um, so if you plot the log of something like, uh, let's say the intensity versus the uh, frequency um, in the log plot, it looks like a straight line. Um, and this has been used um, increasingly to describe interconnected uh, phenomena. In our world today, we tend to be living in a much more interconnected world. Um, so when we take a situation like um, um, a, a watch here, it's, it's certainly complex, okay? Um, and you can use systems analysis on such complex systems to predictably uh, predict how they operate. You can make them larger. Here are robots making cars, they do that in a, in a predictable manner based on, uh, on the, the um, engineering systems analysis. Here we have a integrated circuit um, fabrication facility, a fab um, also relies on um, this type of precision engineering and being able to predict the future, which is essentially how the robot will produce a car or how the machinery here, um, non-human typically, and uh, is producing an integrated circuit. However, um, there's another class that's much larger in terms of the um, complexity. Um, and a case where systems analysis doesn't work in complex systems. Unfortunately, people tend to think in terms of components and try to work out how components work and fit together. Um, but there's um, a, a class where you would say it's interactively complex. And in such a case, there's a great, more, a great deal of freedom and in interaction and you can have cascading effects. Um, you can have kind of catastrophes developing and they appear to appear out of nowhere. They're not associated with a necessarily one component, but they actually arise from the interaction of the components itself. And the more components you have, the more different scales you have, the more complex behavior you have. Um, they can be explained maybe very simply and uh, very, very simply in terms of what and what's known as the Ising model, which most physicists know about. And that is, for instance, in terms of magnetism, if you have a situation where you have a number of magnetic uh, dipoles, in this case, we, we can consider just a few, um, we can have a situation where at low temperatures, the dipoles can't move, um, and the system is more or less sitting um, in... Uh, in a, a 
call it ordered state or a static state. Um, and then you can have a situation at high temperatures uh, where the system is a very dynamic and you would say it's disordered, but there's a point. And if we think of this as a second order phase transition, you can think of this uh, critical point here uh, where um, you have a situation where the correlation length becomes extremely large throughout the, the whole system. And uh, in such cases, you can observe uh, a very interesting uh, phenomena. This is just uh, a plot of that. So you can see the, you can see here the fluctuations that in one case, um, high temperatures, for instance, at low temperatures is fairly static. And here we have uh, the critical point where you have an increase in the correlation. So all the components is generally viewed or talking to each other in, situ in situations like that. And as a result, um, there tends to be um, a relationship here between, in this case, the log of the correlation and distance that follows um, this log-log relationship known as the power law. Um, now these kind of situations um, can arise from the simplest case, like the origins of complexity, where you have two clocks, two pendulum clocks, one in one side of the room, one in the other side of the room. They start to talk to each other and start to become in phase, out of phase, and so on. Um, but you can move that all the way up, sorry, um, all the way up here to the level of, say, ant colonies that um, have an emergent type of behavior, almost like an intelligence, um, all the way up to the human brain, which is a very complex system. So here we have nonlinearity and essential ingredient, something that is sort of intrinsic in uh, climate and degrees of freedom. So the more degrees of freedom, the more nonlinearity, the more you get into a situation of a complex system that exhibits self-organized criticality. And now, uh, in recent years, the last 10 or so years, I've been working um, on trying to emulate um, brain behavior with the idea to make uh, computational devices. And if we look at uh, work by Dante Schialvo, who's a very good friend of mine on uh, functional MRI, if you analyze that data, you see that the brain actually exhibits that type of uh, behavior as you can see in this, uh, these MRIs. And you, even neuron cultures exhibit this type of um, avalanche uh, dynamics. And that was first um, uh, proposed um, by, um, by um, Back and co-workers in terms of a thing called the Sandpile model. And for all its imperfections, um, it's an interesting model to describe how complex systems interact and how you can have some type of behavior um, in terms of self-organized um, criticality emerge, emergent behavior. Okay, so if we look at, in general, a phenomena that is both soci sociological, economic, and uh, um, environmental, we see um, that power laws tend to dominate. Now, I'm gonna hold back and say, this means it's self-organized critical phenomena, but there are a lot of cases and here are some of them. Um, no. Earthquakes, forest fires, solar flares, brain activity, wars, and neurons, and so on. All of these types of behavior um, have been observed. Um, but what I've become interested in recently is um, something that occurs at the end of this log log behavior, which people associate under certain circumstances with self-organized uh, behavior. And that is a, a phenomenon known as, somebody's talking, I don't know who that is, but. Um, hey, uh, Pepe, Pepe, can you meet, mute yourself? I don't see you here. Anyway, let me talk over you. <laughs> um, 
So we have a situation here where we want to have one of these log log plots, you know, and this could be the frequency of events and this could be the size of the event. It could be a forest fire, it could be many things. Um, now, in terms of the <clears throat> sand pile model, you want this uh, behavior is not predicted, but there are other models like uh, forest fires and so on, where one can see this type of behavior. And what, what it means is that the probability here of a large scale event is decreasing. And this is just schematic. There are, there are subtleties in analyzing things, um, but just for the sake of our um, simple discussion, suddenly the probability of a massive giant horrible event pops up. Um, and it's to do, I mean, it's been explained hand wavingly or whatever as a feedback me me mechanism. So we are a system consider um, uh, have our self reinforcement. And so you can have, for instance, oscillators and suddenly this can generate this uh, massive uh, giant event. Do these happen? Well, if we actually look at um, self-organized critical behavior, and if you look at, for instance, epidemics, epidemics is a classic example where, uh, where, where things can get completely out of control and you can have catastrophic behavior. But the environment is also another one where it's extremely complex. So normally when we deal with data, and I teach this in class, um, you have the problem with outliers. So let's say we measure a bunch of measurements and one is extremely high. And if we look at the standard deviation of the data, um, this outlier exceeds the uh, standard deviation by a large amount. We can apply a thing called Chauvinet's uh, criteria and we can kick that data point out. These outliers I'm talking about are something that is uh, has a higher frequency, okay? The, the probability is increasing, even low you would expect it not to occur. Um, and so if you take Zipf's law, which gives you these linear relationships, um, you find strange behavior. One example is if we look at um, wealth, wealth can follow a kind of um, power law uh, dependence, but then you find kings and dragon kings, kings refer also to the behavior of kings. If you look at these kings here, they have just ridiculous wealth. They wouldn't fit on the curve. If you look at cities in, in France and we rank them and look at the size of them, you find a linear relationship. It's very nice on this log log plot, except for one city, Paris is completely anomalous. Um, so things don't necessarily fit in with the uh, nice log log relationships. Um, now, there's some very interesting work from the ATH and Zurich I really like um, about um, things that are meaningful outliers, not outliers you kick out because uh, you don't like them. But here's some that one I mentioned uh, if you look at city sizes, okay, you find these um, significant outliers. Acoustic emission from a material failure as it cracks um, also exhibits this behavior. Lots of financial uh, behaviors, um, epileptic seizures. Um, earthquake energies. They all can exhibit this type of um, Dragon King behavior. And to a certain extent, we ignore Dragon King behavior in real life. But in actual fact, I believe Dragon King behavior on phenomena is something that's going to be increasingly occurring in climate change. So when you say scientists predict things, um, I think we should, I think that's one of the mistakes we do, we make with the public, we give them this idea we can predict things. We can to a certain de degree, but when it comes to the climate, um, we can, and I think we can expect to have, and that's my prediction, Dragon King events happening that will generate massive, massive effects, which will have a sociological Dragon King effect and maybe get people to do something. This is a nice, um, a nice picture from these guys. And what you can see here is a interaction strength versus heterogeneity. And you can see we have this 
kind of self-organized uh, criticality, sometimes called black swan event. Um, and then over here we have um, the synchronization and extreme risks associated with Dragon uh, King events. And below, below here, it would just be incoherent. Um, so we have done, we have mm, over the last 15 years or, or so generated systems that can generate this type of um, self-organized uh, behavior. And we are actually looking now for the Dragon King, if we can generate Dragon Kings and understand a little bit more about it in 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 these uh, these are um, nanoscale networks that are highly interconnected to exhibit um, emergent paper uh, behavior we published tons of papers on them um however to prove things are uh critical in terms of uh certain um, scientists is becoming harder and harder. It used to be you just show a log log plot and there you are, you could say criticality. Um, there are much more complex statistical methods being used. And I sort of published this paper and Charles is also actually a co-author on it. Um, in the, it's in the, the Journal of Physics Complexity, a special edition um, to try to analyze this behavior. And should things look like straight lines or not? And I, I, I honestly have come to this conclusion. I'll continue this work, no problem. But I've come to the conclusion that the, the idea of looking for you know, straight lines, log, log, power law, is not necessarily the way we're going to prove something to be emergent or self-organized critical. So having done all this damn work here, I really think that natural systems need not exhibit this linear um, log log behavior. In fact, they can have very complex structures and still be totally self-organized involving many, many complex types of uh, uh, behavior. Now, if you want to look at really complex behavior, this is something I teach is the carbon cycle. You know, we have the nitrogen cycle, we have the carbon cycle, things like the phosphorus cycle have, are also existing, but they have no atmospheric component. Um, but the carbon cycle has both um, component in the ocean and on the, uh, in the air. And it also has a component in the earth, that is rocks. They act as um, a large sink carbonates for uh, carbon dioxide. But this is an extremely complex situation. And if you, and then you also have photosynthesis here, um, which is producing uh, oxygen from water and so on. This complex system, if you mess around with a tiny bit, um, you can exhibit, you can generate um, terrible complex behaviors that we cannot expect. I would say potentially also eventually dragon-like, um, dragon king-like behavior, meaning the um, things are not going to predict like the, uh, the they're not gonna, the moment the atmospheric uh, scientists have problems to predict that in a reasonable way. But when if you in, if we want to start to include the idea that dragon kings exist in complex, very complex phenomena, then I can see no better place than it would manifest itself than in in, in, in climate change. Um, so this whole business of climate change here in, in terms of this model involves the idea that we have a phase transition or bifurcation, um, a catastrophe, uh, all sorts of things. But it basically it's about multiple layers of um, interconnection and relationships of the world. Something that we as scientists have um, spent many, many years ignoring. I mean, if we look at how we deal with systems, we prefer to deal with closed systems with a few variables. How do we deal with these complex systems? We don't really have a good language or way to handle it, in my opinion. And it's something we should do. And I want to give, um, to finish off, I'm okay on time, right? I have, uh, yeah. Um, I want to finish off with this. So you see these giant waves here? These giant waves um, 
they they destroy very large um, ships, big ones, you know, like the container ships. Maybe two hundred over the last um, X years have uh, disappeared mit- mysteriously at sea, and um, their demise has been um, attributed to a thing called the uh, rogue waves. And rogue waves uh, fascinate me at the moment. These are examples of rogue, rogue waves. So if you go to um, a naval engineer or a ship designer, okay, he will show you um, a graph like this. And he'll say, well, this is uh, based on the, a, you know, the standard model, not the standard model that Charles is always talking about, the standard model for uh, designing ships and waves. Waves follow this, well, it, maybe it's log normal, but it's almost Gaussian. Um, and you have a most probable height, and then we have you know, lower probabilities here of uh, higher wave heights, but nothing on the range above you know, 10 meters, or it's more like five, five meters in height. So this is how we design ships. And if you, des- if you take a ship, and here we have a ship, which is actually my remote control, and you have these giant waves and you actually have a ship on the edge here. Um, they're not designed to handle, you know, 20, 30 uh, meter waves, 100 meter wave, 100 foot waves. They will fall apart because it's outside of the design criteria. Um, in 1978, this, um, this uh, ship here called the Munchen mysteriously disappeared at sea. It was... Um, Germany had made this kind of super tanker and they thought it was, uh, you know, indestructible, blah, blah, blah. And they based it on this type of design principle. When they went out into the ocean, um, out of nowhere appeared a rogue wave and the ship was uh, never found, actually. If you look at the damage on ships, um, big ships hit by rogue waves, you just see giant holes in them. Waves are generated by many things, wind, tides, um, tsunamis, it can be pressure induced and so on. Um, This is typically associated with um, wind and ocean. And there have been many theories about it. One of the most interesting models is actually a nonlinear Schrodinger equation has actually been used to predict these uh, rogue waves. And they're a real fact. And they're one of these examples of something I would say you could call um, a dragon king. And we can expect to see more of them when we, you know, one of the things about the uh, temperature changes, we say, oh yeah, the temperature's going up, it's getting terrible. In reality, what we're, when we talk about climate changes, that we're talking about different regions um, under different conditions, which are exhibiting extremes that are, let's say, one extreme or the other extreme. There's an inhomogeneity in in what's going on. So this idea, a two degrees, we're all going to die. Yeah, we look at the statistics at temperature. Yeah, I'm sure it's the case, but there are much more. uh, What what would be the worst situation here? Let's say um, that we uh, have increases in uh, extreme weather. And one of them would be the rogue waves. And we reached a significant number. And, you know, one in every, I think, 10,000 waves is a rogue wave. If we increase that number or increase the energy density in the ocean, where we could even go above 30 meters, maybe it's possible. Well, it would mean that all the shipping that came from China um, would have a significant chance of disappearing in the ocean. You've seen these big tankers loaded up to the gunnels. Um, They wouldn't survive. So maybe one of the things, and this is, I'm being a bit crazy, but uh, Charles is uh, encouraging that type of thing. What happens if suddenly um, all your Amazon orders that (laughs) didn't arrive? Would that generate sufficient outrage uh, by the uh, consumer society that they would actually say, we have to do something about the climate? We have to actually cut down on the carbon dioxide. One of the theories by this guy, this the guy from the um, ETH, which is rather interesting, is ETH. Sorry, um, is is the social, the social reaction of people. 
Only when there's something that's absolutely terrible do people react. So you can have people getting shot every day in America. Not, nobody does anything. But if somebody shoots 300 people, okay, suddenly it's big news. It doesn't last long, but it propagates through the system. So in a way for emergent emergency, I think for society to react, we have to have a really big emergent emergency that's going to actually cause them and their distribution of reactions to um, have a Dragon King event. However, when I think about all these things, um, I think also back to 1970, and uh, I was very um, excited, you know, to learn about Buckminster Fuller from Victoria. She's a friend of the family. Um, and way back then, he, um, uh, Buckminster Fuller published a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And in it, um, he looked at um, the whole planet to be a spaceship and the idea that you have a relationship to the planet, that things are interconnected. Um, and uh, since 1970, uh, I don't know where we are, but, uh, you know, don't look up. <laughs> and we are actually sick. We are not looking up. No one is, uh, a few people are looking up, the converted, but the vast majority are not looking up. Nor are the politicians or the corporations. They're kidding on. They're looking up and they're not looking up. They're looking down. And in that thing, it's amazing how you get a political movement. Is it? Don't look up. Don't look at reality. Don't look at what's in front of your face, you know? Um, so Dragon Kings. Um, so I can, I, I would say that um, we're going to have Dragon Kings in the climate change. They're not going to follow even our nice, you know, power law distributions, which already were causing problems. We are going to have at the tipping point such complex systems interacting so strongly that the emergent behavior that comes out of there is going to be something that's way beyond science that we cannot predict at the moment. And uh, it's a bit like, um, you know, and I believe it, the ocean is where it will happen. This marvelous things, of course, happen with water. You can have solitons. You can have all sorts of interesting wave phenomena. You can have these um these cells, convection cells, self-organizing. The atmosphere itself is actually made up of these Hadley cells, which are very um, sensitive. And, and of course, our ocean currents, which are governed by salinity and temperature, they are being influenced like the uh, Gulf Stream and the likes. But, um, if these things in the ocean go ha haywire, which they they will, they I, I'm saying they will, like uh, I know, but let's say they do. Um, we really, really, really then have a mega problem. Not just, you know, the fact your holiday home on the beach is, you know, uh, going to be uh, underwater. Much, much bigger problems. Okay, so let me just switch and jump over these. These are just some examples of our machine. That we are actually, this is where I want to look for some kind of dragon king events. And I think we, if we, if we do something to the system uh, and push it really hard, maybe we'll get some dragon kings. Um, okay, let me finish with the uh, three slides. Uh, many years ago, I got together in uh, Sardinia, this was with uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Heine Rohrer, who's a great friend of mine. That's me with hair. And this is Walter Freeman, who studied um, self-organized uh, critical phenomena and stuff in the brain in Berkeley. Um, and when we got together in 2002, um, this was the conclusion of our uh, think tank, was challenge and understand and communicate with the brain, something in terms of our neuromorphic engineering I've been doing for about 10 years. Um, but I would change it today and score out the brain and write, understand and communicate somehow with the environment, work with the environment. Um, 
maybe it's too late. Instead, we work against the environment. Um, in terms of communication, I think Victoria talked about her marvelous work in um, bringing uh, brains together in a very interesting way to communicate. Um, Takashi, um, who is uh, and Chuck Taylor here, who um, he's in Tokyo and he was at UCLA Evolutionary Biology. Um, anyway, Takashi. Um, has done marvelous simulations, which were used actually as art pieces. And I think using artists and dancers, anyone we can to try to get this message across about the environment is important. But you can see here a simulation, which has a million um, voids in it. And you can see the emerging behavior. And it's something that um, a large number of the public have seen and they can relate to it. You give them a mathematical description of that, and um, um, they won't know what to do. Here's a nice picture, actually, of uh, Takeshi's um, blades. Okay, so I'm going to finish the talk now. Um, I think I've talked too long. But um, some somebody said Lenin said this, but you know it's often quoted as a Buddhistic thing. Nothing ever exists entirely alone. Everything is in relationship to everything else. And this is a picture I took uh, where we have a home in uh, Rhinebeck in in New York. We have a lake there, and it's a beautiful picture. And it shows you the water. It shows you the water vapor in terms of the mist, the trees and the reflections, and I've actually turned this upside down. So if you turn this upside down, this is the reflection in the water, and this is actually the, the air. But you see, how do you disconnect all of these phenomena? And when you look at a lake, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting example, a sort of microcosm. Um, but we have to accept as scientists that how do we look at everything at the one time? And the way we, tend, we, we can look at it is that we look at the interactions of many things and we forget focusing on each damn object. So, you know, we look at, oh, yeah, the smoke coming out here and therefore we do a calculation. No, it's much more complex than that. And so my talk um, is finished and uh, I'm extremely uh, pessimistic about <laughs> pessimistic about what's going to happen in the future, even pessimistic about where we can escape to. I was thinking New Zealand might be a good place, but I'm not sure now. Anyway, thank you very much. And thank you, Charles, for organizing this great um, meeting. And I have uh, stepped out of my bounds as a careful scientist and said some things probably uh, if it was a, I wouldn't put in the scientific paper necessarily, but things that I believe in. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Jim. That was such a powerful talk. Um, pretty scary. Sobering. Yeah. Sobering. Sobering, yeah. Jim, I didn't mean to yell at my computer at the beginning of your talk. I'm such a Zoom dork. I couldn't get my video to stop playing, and I had to shove it under the couch cushion to make it. <laughs> I thought she was yelling at me, asking you about your <laughs> procedure. <laughs> no. I was like, yeah, I guess I shouldn't share that in front of everybody. No, the, the amount I'm of things such a is... Zoom dork. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. What a beautiful talk. What a sobering and heartbreaking talk. And you talk about the Musk point of view. Do you, Jim, still believe we can engineer our way out of this? Do we still dream of that? It's nonsense. Well, whenever we think engineering, we think, uh, you know, Okay, uh, let's look at this. We have a hole in this pipe. Let's put a piece of tape around it or let's do this. I mean, let's reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Let's stop using fossil fuels. The reality is that we, we can. Right. We can. The there's no political will. Uh, in terms of the economics, there is, there is no will. I mean, it's a marvelous future. I think, you know, you China, may, maybe China could do it because they're able to, you know, impose their will on the people in a way that we are not. I mean, if we can't even get people to get um, a booster shot or, or you know, we, we, how could, you know, we have this COVID situation. 
And the solution to it is fairly simple. We came up with vaccines. But then we look at the social side, and this is the same as the environmental problems. There is no willing, there's a whole bunch of people that are against it. Okay. Okay. Question. You know, the coal mining area, what's his, you know, that um, senator, uh, I forgot his name, He's supposed to be a um, Democrat, but you know. Don't mention it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they think that way. Uh, the people that support Trump think that way. Um, even nothing for the children of the future. I mean, that is our future, or the children. We are not the future unless we want to live forever with using age extension and the fact that we're billionaires. Um, and the fact, I think the thing is, everything is interconnected. And really, I mean, it's Buddhism. It's very close to Buddhism. It's actually close to Quaker philosophy as well. But um, nothing exists alone. And... I think we just looking at things, look at the interaction of things. If you look at your your own life. Yeah. I think uh, George had a question for you. Yeah, sure. George, great. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, okay. George. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim. That's great. Uh, very, very interesting um, um, gestalt, you might say, on <laughs> On the whole, on a, a, a huge interconnected problem, but I remember in one of your slides it said the fundamental cause of weather is the effect of sun on the earth. Now, back in the days before um, climate change was a, a big deal, um, or as big a deal as it could have been, it could it should be. Um, there was a lot of talk about what non-anthropogenic sources and non Earth-based sources of climate uh, variability were, and I have not heard that uh, analysis of of the uh, of, of solar variations of um, the Milankovitch uh, sites. Yeah. yeah, all sorts of stuff which seems to have dropped off the map. I'm not saying that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that. That, that we, we should replace an exact uh, an analysis of anthropogenic sources, but it seems that. Uh, whatever public activity uh, and 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 a lot of scientific activity has gone on recently has, I, I, I maybe I just haven't looked at it, but neglected. Yeah. No, I understand what you're Possible causes. Yeah. So okay. So <clears throat> there are there is um there is what well, is complicated variations of the Earth's angle and the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and it's and and they're called Milankovitch cycles. And basically, they occur over very long periods of time. You know, you're talking more like thousands of years rather than they're not yearly things. Then you have, you know, sunspot activity, but we can find no correlation necessarily between that and the kind of events occurring on the planet in terms of the, the climate uh, temperature. And then you have other things like, for instance, the moon, the moon wobbles, okay? So at the moment, we can expect uh, over the next five, 10 years that the tides are going to increase, okay, which increases the probability of flooding. But none of these, um, these uh, sources from, like the, from the sun or the uh, moon, et cetera, and probably, you know, every other planet, I mean, everything is interacting, right, are are directly attributable to the effect. However, you know, in my picture, this is just in my mind, we have, let's say, this massive ocean. And I had a beautiful picture I, I, I took, but it was a, of a Google Earth, where you, if you turn the Earth around, you'll just see it's blue. You don't see any, you know, islands, nothing, hardly. Um, in that ocean, there's all this energy and weird phenomena occurring. And these uh, rogue waves, of course, are one example. The, um, the currents, the ocean currents are another one. They're all very, they're all very, so that they come, they emerge from nothing. 
And this nonlinear Schrodinger equation fascinated me. I'm, I'm no expert on nonlinear Schrodinger equations, but they're able to predict, for instance, that out of the ocean, there's a, this energy, and let's say it's some from the moon, from the sun, from the wind, and so on, the tides, all of this energy, there's um, a kind of, I, I hate to use the word mathematical solution, but from that, can emerge anything. So rogue waves can emerge from that. Um, weird phenomena can emerge. And as we as we continue to heat up the planet and, and continue to put more energy in there, and remember the ocean is the, the thing that keeps this planet temperature stable, the salinity and the temperature changes and so on, they're going to result in, in dramatic effects. One of them is the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream it also arises from uh, changes in salinity and, and temperature and so on. It's slowing down. Now, if it slows down, um, Europe, which relies on uh, warming from the Gulf Stream to maintain a nice uh, temperature, it, Europe could become freezingly cold. Um, and then it could also become extremely hot, but it become really cold because the Gulf Stream's warming effect would uh, eliminate itself. And the change in that ocean flow current, those ocean currents can also result in extreme variations in temperature. That's why I, I, th I think climate change is something uh, that one should think about a lot. And it's, it's not just the average temperature. Once we have these temperature differentials, and particularly when we screw around with the ocean currents, we I, th I think we're beyond the tipping point then. But your question is very good, you know, um, and there are lots of people argue about, you know, it's all to do with the sun variation, but it's really... I could send you my lecture class. I'd do a whole lecture proving that it's not that effect. I mean, we, we had a terrible situation in chemistry. We and somebody who I'm not going to tell you whose name is invited a scientist who is quite well known, who I'm not going to give their name, who said that climate change was a hoax in the chemistry seminar. And he went on and he said, well, you know, I mean, at the moment, we're about 400 and, I don't know, 15 ppm CO2. He said, oh, it can go up to 2,000 ppm. It's no problem. Um, the plants will grow faster, and so that will get that will solve the problem. It, it, there was outrage in the chemistry department. That this guy, This guy, turns out, he gets his money from oil companies, okay? And why he was allowed to give a talk in the chemistry department, I don't know. But maybe we should have an open mind to these uh, these goofballs and you know prank you know jokers that are uh, going round with their stories. It's like the election was stolen, you know. There is the the, the global uh, climate change hoax, you know. Just keep going, doing what you're doing, and uh, kill off kill off everything for the ch for your children, because. Climate change is not going to destroy the planet. It won't destroy the planet. It'll do not, the planet will keep going. Yeah. Uh, sure, some species animals will die. Hopefully we are the first, but we won't be, unfortunately. Um, many species will die. We will have uh, massive shortages of uh, food and endless problems. We'll, be, <laughs> we'll have wars and everything. Um, but the planet's going to be fine. Really, the planet will be fine. It's not going to end up like Venus. Venus is a classic example, a runaway greenhouse gas planet, where you do the theoretical calculation on the back of the envelope, and it's a beautiful calculation to do, and you'll find that Venus should be really cold. But because it's got a very dense CO2 atmosphere, and this has to do with the history of the past, and the geology, and so on, um, it just has a massive, it's the example of runaway greenhouse gas effect. And it was used by Carl Sagan actually to uh, back in 85 to try to gain attention to the, the potential problem we face here. 
So we have a maybe, question in the, oh, go ahead. Uh, maybe we should, I just want to bring in two or three points. One is we really need to take a historical perspective. I mean, 10,000 years ago, you know, Cape Cod here in Massachusetts, you know, due to the uh, ice age and the glaciers and so on, we've had humans surviving, you know, pick your number, 100,000, few hundred thousand years. They went through a lot of, of stuff. Uh, we've had all sorts of other calamities happen on this earth. The Europeans went ahead and they did much worse than the Amazon in getting rid of all of their trees, uh, deforested Europe. Uh, you know, and so, uh, uh, so you could have said Europe was a little lungs of the planet. So I think we have to take this perspective. And I think we, I thought like what Jim said, I mean, here we have gear coming along and saying, Hey, China, you're getting too big for your britches. Why don't we take out about 30 to a hundred, maybe 500 container ships. And there we'll have a trillion dollars at the bottom of the sea. And now let's see what happens to your economy. So economies can't take major uh, economic hits like that. You saw what happened just with the mortgages back in 2008. I think if we lost about uh, 10, 20 big container ships, you'd have a very big problem. Um, to say nothing of 100, which could easily happen if we had mm -hmm. a large, you know, th uh, hundreds of miles rift. The second thing I want to quickly bring up is the notion of human. Maybe what we need, Charles, is we need a meeting like this, but we'd have attending um, psychiatrists. When I was in New York for two years, I made a point of, <laughs> of, of getting very friendly with the psychiatrist of the billionaires. And I learned a tremendous amount. They couldn't tell me who they were, give me specifics. But the, it, when you get to that level, you, you become mentally ill. Uh, you, you, first of all, you had to be a bit... Uh, a bit uh, 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 sociologic, a sociopath, certainly a psychopath, but certainly a sociopath to do what you do because it involves a grabbing and so on. So I, without a doubt, the billionaires have all have a, a, a major set of uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, and they can't, or else they would have taken their money and done something useful with it. They don't even do anything to extend their lifespan. They just spend it on like putting young blood into their bodies or some <laughs> other sort of system nonsense that, that's a fad. So, so basically, uh, all I'm simply saying is right. one, what's going to happen is going to happen. And maybe we should be talking about a future Earth that will be different, that will have melted glaciers, that will have, you know, uh, 100 feet higher uh, levels, that will have a different economy, that will have whole uh, mm -hmm. existing humans wiped out, and that we should have conferences that are planning for this potential, you know, uh, Jim Jim uh, uh, in inevitability. Yeah. Because it's going to happen, just like Europe, the trees went, you know, the Ice Age. And then the last, the other point is that I really am serious about getting, I even think we should have con men here, uh, advertising experts who understand how the human being works, uh, <laughs> drug dealers. I mean, people who really know how this Drug stuff dealers. Works. You know, I mean, no, drug dealers, not dealers. Drug dealers. <laughs> and, uh, mafia, mafia, people who really oh, understand you. people. And, and, and how can one go ahead and, I mean, one of my best friends was was a B.F. Skinner, and now he's he's condemned and so on. But I think a lot of us should go back and read some of his books to understand how we can let this COVID thing get insanely out of hand. Because mm -hmm. we can find it, you know, who said earlier about the dust, you know, there's no escape. But anyway, no. I'm done. I uh, just want to bring it. Up. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I agree with you, Robert. I mean, the the. The ability of con men is quite amazing, right? I mean, if you look at, I mean, I say Trump and, and is one example. There are many, you know, uh, people who have this amazing uh, capability of taking absolute nonsense and making people believe it. And yet we as uh, talking about environmental uh, science, uh, nobody's interested, We've got a limited audience. So what have they got that we don't have? Maybe we should, I agree, we should bring them in. We have to do something to wake people up. Yeah. We have the, you know, the classic elephant in the room phenomena. You know, the bloody giant elephant is there and nobody wants to talk about it. They're all sitting drinking a cup of tea. Well, you just get rid of the damn democracy, as they say, and we'll have a nice uh, mm -hmm. a, a dictatorship state, and then we can okay. coerce and do everything that China and potentially Russia can do. Well, its people. You know, what would be maybe as useful as what we're trying to do at the moment is say, we as scientists 
don't know what the hell is going to happen, but the chances yeah. are it's going to be worse than we even imagined. And we give up. Screw you. <laughs> screw you. Screw you. To hell with, you know, we, we're sitting in our labs, we're doing this, we're giving the talks, we're wasting our time, and you're sitting there in Congress or wherever you're sitting doing bugger all about it, and uh, it just, oh yeah, he's just a scientist. Why don't we just say, screw it? We all go through the phase, of course. <laughs> just let the whole thing crash. You we'll just let know we'll you have to figure develop out how to you survive. To develop and, and like what you say, Robert, we'll figure out how to survive um, through it because we have the science and technology. You we just, just need a few millionaires to give us the money so that we can build the domes or whatever the hell we're going to live in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I love this discussion. Um, we're running a little bit over time uh, for uh, Marcus's next talk on uh, the sound that protein makes or how to interpret the structure and behavior of protein through sound. And also, uh, potentially, he's going to talk about how we can communicate with spiders based on the vibrations and sound of their webs. I'm not sure if he's going to cover that or not. But this is so exciting. But that's very exciting talk. And <laughs> I just I love this discussion about the climate and, you know, advanced propulsion and energy. Well, you know, that's my naive thought of, hey, can we develop a technology say harvesting the quantum vacuum that gets us off fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera, and enables us to avoid this um, catastrophe that seems to be coming. And um, anyway, okay, so th thank you so much, Jim. That was a very powerful talk. I, very powerful. I just, uh, I loved your talk and I love the discussion. Thank you so much. Introduce Marcus. Yeah, so uh, Marcus is a, a professor at MIT of, uh, Civil and in civil and environmental engineering is that right, Marcus? Yes. Yes, and um, you know works on a lot of uh, wonderful mechanical things, and but doing this this beautiful work on again, like I said, uh, uh, using AI and uh, to um, look at the sound of of proteins and then using that information to design new proteins, et cetera. I'm not gonna say more because uh, I, I can't really do it justice. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I, um, you know, thank you for the invitation. Um, um, and uh, thanks for all for being here. I think it's, you know, getting late in the day and you know, we, we had a long, long day um, of, of great talk. So um, well, I'm honored to be right after um, Jim's presentation. Uh, followed your work for many, many years since I was a graduate student. So um, yeah, what I'll do, uh, my, my talk is gonna be a little bit different. So I won't talk too much about the environment, even though I will touch upon this a little bit on, on in, later, in the later part of my talk. But I, um, as Charles said, I was sort of, um, I was asked to talk about what we're doing in, in uh, understanding the, the sounds of matter and, and how we can communicate with, uh, potentially other species in that in that way uh, and other scales. Okay, so this talk will really be about uh, a title. Actually, the title that Charles came up with was um, originally "Protein Sound," and I added a little bit to that the nexus of sound, matter, and life. Um, so, uh, can I just? I'm sorry to interrupt. I oh, want oh, to yeah, stop.